Welcome back, everybody, to our Zoys online lecture series featuring social science research on Ukraine. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Victoria Sereda to this series. Um, Victoria is a sociologist with many different affiliations. She's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Ethnology at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. She's had that position since 2020. She's currently based, based in Jena at the Imre Kertes Kolleg. And she also has a long-standing affiliation with the Ukrainian Catholic University, where she's taught and also other many other international um, research institutions and universities where she's held uh, fellowships. She has led or participated in a many uh, sociologically oriented research projects on Ukrainian society, in particular also on its regional dimensions. And she, from 2011 to 2017, was the head of um, the sociology team of the project Region, Nation and Beyond, an interdisciplinary and transcultural reconceptualization of Ukraine. This was organized by the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And um, I think uh, many of you interested in research in particular on uh, regional issues in Ukraine will have come across this project. She was also um, the MAPA Research Fellow at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University, um, a project that um, focuses also on the visualization of um, data um, uh, with reference to Ukraine. Her research topics are, there are many of them, but she focuses among other things, as I said, on um, uh, regional issues, but also nationalism, migration, identity studies, memory studies, civil society, and urban sociology. And um, I think we got to know each other more or better when we worked together on a special issue of um, Europe Asia studies, which came out in 2020, but work on that started much earlier. And the issue was on war and displacement, the case of Ukraine. Um, then we were looking at displacement um, from Donbass. And um, Victoria is continuing her work on displacement and now and in, in, an, in a different, in a new uh, context. And she will talk to us today about transnational experiences of displacement from Ukraine. Thank you so much, Victoria, for participating. And uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Gwendolyn, for sh uh, allowing me and giving me this floor and allowing me to share with, with your audience and with academic community uh, results of my research. And uh, today I will be mostly talking about my uh, research, which started uh, with the annexation of Crimea and uh, conflict over the Donbass, but I will try to uh, apply trans scholar ap approach and tr trans try to to place first of all the the transnational experiences of displacement uh, of displacement from Ukraine on a bigger scale on a global scale and then I will uh, come back to to European region and look at certain experiences of people going to different countries. And then I will come to Ukrainian case, and and then at the very end I will share a little bit of my uh, new research uh, outcomes of my new research linked to people leaving Ukraine after the February twenty two. So uh, with the global dismay, recently uh, a new 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 um, report of uh, World Organization of Migration, the global displacement has uh, had by 2020 uh, close to uh, 80,100 million uh, people displaced. And here we will talk about a uh, quarter million, um, 25 million people who, who were uh, as a refugees and uh, even more who are displaced within their countries. And we, we should also talk about stateless people. All these categories uh, up to when were present in Ukrainian society since uh, 2014. And if we look at the most sending and uh, main receiving countries, we won't fi find Ukraine among the main sending uh, displacement population uh, countries in 2018, but in 2015, Ukraine was among top fifth, uh, five countries uh, in the world sending uh, or having displaced population. 
And we also should uh, notice that uh, there are two countries about which I'll be talking today or mentioning today, uh, those that are receiving uh, refugees. Uh, and here we are talking about Turkey and Germany. And my research, uh, I, I did some research in, in uh, both of those countries. We also have to keep in mind, and uh, a lot of uh, scholars are saying that issue of uh, refugees is, is a very important and, uh, and it grows every year. And now with the beginning of uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine, we have over 100 uh, million people displaced. So uh, we have a, a surge uh, in, in the country, uh, in the world, uh, in numbers of both refugees and displaced and Ukraine here it plays a very important role now. So if we're talking about pre-2022 uh, situation, uh, according to the report uh, of World Migration Report, uh, in Europe, there were two countries that were mainly sending uh, asylum seeking uh, population uh, within the Europe. This would be uh, Ukraine and Russia. And if you are talking about displaced, uh, the only displacement which was due to uh, violence and internal conflict uh, was, uh, was Ukraine. All other displaced population were due to, to, to weather conditions or disasters happening in those countries. So uh, when we are talking about displacement and refugees, uh, we quite often are talking about certain universal treaties which are with us since the uh, 50s. And uh, those uh, policies and those treaties quite often are characterized by uh, fundamental power uh, as uh, asymmetries. And uh, Stephen Castle uh, describes them as uh, inequality of citizenship. So on the one si side, if we are looking at, uh, at those universal treaties or human rights uh, treaties, they are uh, constructed and seen as, uh, as a global uh, public good, uh, refugee protection, ideologically uh, structured ar around this, uh, constructed as a global public good uh, that states should uh, collectively value and support. But in reality, quite often, those states have very little incentive to assume the role of uh, providers. So to receive uh, the refugees and provide them with, with support and care. And if you're talking about uh, internally displaced population, then the state itself, uh, where the situation where displacement is happening is uh, the responsible for, for the support of those who are displaced. Uh, in, in this uh, sense, uh, I, I'm working with uh, certain uh, concepts introduced by uh, American sociologist, uh, Jaron Kim, who introduces idea of logic of rescue, or she's also talking about salvability of, uh, in her case, irregular migrants, but we also use this term uh, when we are looking at refugees, at people who are trying to go outside of their country and, and seek for, for the protection. And uh, quite often exploiting this existing legal and ethical frameworks for international humanitarian or human rights states uh, might pursue their own interest because, as I said, they have very little incentive to assume role of providers. And if they are providing, uh, they quite often are pursuing their own, uh, own interest. And they use media or political campaigns to explain their population, why particular category of migrants is force of being rescued or why uh, priority is given to a certain uh, group of people. And I want to look at the case of Ukrainians who decided to, to move abroad after the annexation of Crimea and beginning of conflict in Donbass. 
And I think it's very could be for us very interesting an overlooked case uh, of conflict related migration and show how this discourse of politics of humanitarianism saving Ukrainian uh, refugees helping uh, our neighbors and so on can, can be used or abused for political purposes of influence seeking for managing otherness within their national borders for economic benefits uh, and even recently we witnessed uh, for a pretext to launch a war against the neighbors so here we can talk about the phenomena uh, which is quite worrisome uh, using ukrainian case uh, refugee weaponization so uh, i'll look at different directions where the displaced people from ukraine uh, were heading to uh, the biggest flow went to russia uh, because in 2000 back in 2014 there was no visa free regime with uh, with eu and western uh, borders of the country so uh, to escape that direction was quite difficult and majority of people were move, moving or escaping uh, where they could so according to both Rose data statistics and, uh, and other European statistics, close to 1 million refugees went to Russia between 2014 and 2020. But if we look at the statistics uh, of refugee uh, or asylum seeking, we see that only uh, over 1,000 of IDP uh, received IDP status. And in Russia, this IDP status is limited only to people who can prove their Russian origin. And another thousand uh, received refugee status. And this is according to Rostat data. So if we look at the numbers of people who were able to receive refugee status, we see that uh, it's approximately lower than 0.2% and 10, 10 times lower than in EU if we would compare statistics. So uh, Ukrainian refugees of Russian origin could also apply for so-called compatriots program, which was settled long before the beginning of the conflict. And this program had very tricky criteria. So first of all, it required uh, applicants to be brought up in traditions of Russian culture. And of course, this is a very vague formulation and uh, proficiency of Russian language and also possess a professional skills. So uh, applicants, uh, in addition to that, applicants could not choose the location where they would be sent by the government. Uh, so government would decide which or defined which regions uh, and where this this successful applicants would go to and quite often this would be uh, remote depopulated areas that needed additional human capital or human resources so uh, if we are looking at the situation uh, in between 2014 and 2020 in Russia we can say that as as a result many displaced persons had to opt for documented or undocumented labor migration because the success rate of uh, in receiving refugee status was extremely low and and then uh, in the case of compatriots program you might be sent to a very remote uh, regions where you won't be willing to stay uh, and uh, but if we look at the policy policies we we see that russian government privileged first of all per permanent residency and citizenship to people of working age and ethnic russians so we have two types of privileges working age with specific skills and uh, ethnic ethnically privileged uh, we, I, I, would, I should also mention the passportization program, which was a similar policy that followed by Russia earlier in Crimea and also in some other territories of the conflict, such as Transnistria, Abkhazia, and, and now we currently hear that they are planning to do the very similar thing in uh, newly occupied territories of Kherson and other regions. 
So uh, when we look at uh, how people describe the situation, the, the, those inhabitants of Crimea and Donbass who moved to Russia reported that they uh, newly re-articulated Russia, Russian identity because quite often all these programs or statuses were linked to the Russian identity, Russian culture and, and Russian language. Uh, so, but their belonging to the local communities was was quite often questioned on, on the basis of their citizens stat status, because formally they still were citizens of Ukraine, and they had to follow all the prescriptions or regulations uh, linked to the mi migration regulations. But also in ethno-linguistic differences, first of all, because many of them could be spotted uh, because of the soft uh, or spe specific way of, of speaking Russian with soft G, for example. And others who were relocated exactly with this compatriots program, they uh, also encountered uh, discussions or debates or tensions between the indigenous population uh, of those regions who felt that they are exploited by uh, Russians who come and exploit their natural resources and do not return, given in return enough uh, uh, infrastructural support. Uh, so they were not so welcoming Russians. And, and this was a big surprise for those who were sent within this compatriots program to those remote, uh, remote regions. Uh, if we look at the situation in EU, we have to keep in mind that this is exactly of, uh, of the time when uh, there was a big migration crisis linked to the Syria uh, in, in EU. And uh, if we look at the numbers, numbers uh, were, were extremely low. People could not cross the border till visa free regime uh, was uh, intact. So uh, we are talking about roughly, according to the statistics, uh, 2,000 people who applied for the uh, refugee status in EU, uh, and uh, only 400 applicants were granted uh, uh, this, this status with the, within within two first two years of the conflict. And we can talk about 2% of people among those who applied. Uh, at the same time, if you look at our neighboring countries, uh, in between 2014 and 2016, um, 5,000 people applied in Poland and only uh, close to 50 were granted this status in Hungary, even less. But if we look at the media discourse uh, in both of these countries, they were using Ukrainian refugees as a pretext uh, to manage otherness within their countries. So they were claiming that they have close to million or so many thousand Ukrainian refugees on their territories. And for this reason, they could not accept quotas of Syrian re refugees. So they were using this, this humanitarian uh, brotherly support of Ukrainian refugees as, as a pretext uh, for, for managing other, otherness in their societies. But in reality, percentage of Ukrainians who received this status was extremely low. And if you look at, at the Germany, which is country with high, one of the highest percent of uh, people who uh, of receiving refugees, still Ukrainians were uh, in a very tiny percent of people, 25 people could receive the status before, uh, before uh, 2022. So what was happening as a result, many displaced persons had again opt for documented or in many cases undocumented labor migration, at least till uh, 2017. And then gradually there were more documented labor mi mi migration uh, uh, groups. Uh, when we look at the interviews, people would complain about uncertainty of their legal status uh, if they apply for the uh, refugee status and uh, this application won't be successful, then they can be deported anytime. So in this case, people would not opt to apply. 
uh, they were also uh, talking about that they were trying to distance both from old post-Soviet or Russian speaking diaspora and Ukrainian diaspora uh, and attempt to integrate as quickly as possible and main barriers for them would be language and uneven citizenship that they would be treated uh, as as not this with not not the same as people coming from or refugees coming from from other countries uh, Turkey would be very interesting case to look at because uh, Turkey also privileges strongly uh, migrants with ethnic origin. So the definition of migrant in Turkish legislation is very narrow. Uh, and both settlement law and citizenship law uh, in, in both of these laws, migrants are per, uh, persons of Turkish descent. And if we look at, at those who would migrate or would be displaced from Ukraine towards Turkey, this would be two groups. One of them, Meshketin Turks and other Crimean Tatars. Now the first group could claim ethnic origin similar to or same as Turkish ethnic origin. And then uh, this group would be treated with, with within this citizen or settlement law. They would receive a lot of privileges. They will be, uh, if you look for the statistics, they are present there. There are a lot of media coverage uh, about those families of Turk, Turks, Meshkitans who resettled to Turkey. And even recently with, with the uh, Russian aggression after the February 22, uh, there was another wave of resettlement of Turks, Meshkitans. And again, it was media uh, covered by Turkish media. Uh, the legal grounds for the uh, refugee status is very complicated in Turkey. So first of all, according to, uh, to, to the law, only those who come from Europe could claim asylum uh, seeking status. So, and could be called refugees. Uh, of course, Crimean Tatars could be, uh, could be treated as, as a group coming from Europe. Uh, and uh, during this uh, refugee crisis in, in Europe 2015, uh, Turkey managed to negotiate with EU that Turkish government uh, would uh, subordinate international refugee law and national legislation uh, would be defining the legal regime uh, governing refugees uh, and would have a higher priority than international laws. This would apply to, for example, this was an instrument to contain Syrian refugees and other refugees under a temporary protection regime. So a uh, Turkish government would use them, this would be an instrument as a political utility of refugees. And if we look at the statistics, both Turkish or uh, European statistics about Turkish refugees, Crimean Tatars are missing within those, those statistics. So they neither have a right to this privileged migrant position, nor they are counted as refugees uh, within, within the Turkey. And it created a lot of uh, problems and issues for the Crimean Tatars who would resettle to Turkey. First of all, uh, absolute uncertainty of their legal status, and many of them tried hard, high, hard to get certain status, and then they would leave back either for Ukraine or other countries. Uh, they were also talking about distancing again from the old Russian speaking diaspora or post-Soviet diaspora, but also a lot of misunderstanding within the old Crimean Tatar diaspora. And they would complain again, similarly like Ukrainians who went to you about the uneven citizenship approach to them. So if we're talking about this period uh, in between 2014 and 2022, uh, most of these places were contained within the Ukraine, within the country. And uh, if we look at the patterns of resettlement, we again see that these patterns were not even. 
uh, approximately over 50% of displaced would registered displaced would settle uh, close to the contact lines uh, within the Donbass or close to Crimea. And some of them would also opt for, for Kyiv, and uh, this would cover approximately 75% uh, of displaced population in the country. And uh, in Mariupol, for example, 25% of uh, Mariupol's population uh, currently was uh, made by uh, IDPs. So uh, those who, who were resettled, and this would be the majority close to, uh, at the beginning, this was close to 2 million, and uh, by 2021, uh, uh, this was 1.5 million of people, uh, those who were officially registered within Ukraine as a displaced. Uh, they were claiming, uh, oh, if you look at how they described the situation in themselves, as soon as they were resettled, even they were, even though they were resettled close, quite close uh, within their region, many of them uh, would say or describe their situation that they felt lost and unrooted. And many also uh, said that due to the decommunization, they felt that in addition to that, they felt that they are coming from the ghost places because uh, there are no such names any longer on maps. So you are coming from a ghost place and you, you feel lost in the new place you arrive. And they were saying that their sense of belonging they was lost also to a bigger uh, imagined communities. Could, this could be transnational, such as, for example, Slavic, East Slavic, or Soviet, or national, in, in, uh, and they, that they had to re-articulate their belonging, but also quite often to regional, for example, Don, to Donbass, or even to local immediate community of neighbors. Uh, at, when the, at the moment when they were resettling, uh, we, we coincided with uh, the decommunization process in Ukraine. So quite often they were coming to the cities where very intensive processes of rearticulation of identity and memory spaces was, was happening with the, within those, uh, those cities. And a new cult of heroes was also built up uh, first uh, link to the Heavenly Hundred, to the Euromaidan, and later to those who, who, who died uh, during the conflict over the Donbass. And there will be a lot of public spaces, and we, can, we are talking about grassroots initiatives commemorating those who, who, who were uh, killed there. So uh, in some interviews, and in addition to that, uh, we had a wave of so-called Rush, Rush, Ruska Vesna, Russian Spring, where Russia uh, was uh, media, in Russian media, we had a lot of uh, uh, ideological debates that all Novorossia belongs to, 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 the, to the common space. And uh, in, and that they, Russia could come and liberate those Russian speaking population uh, if they would su uh, su support some separatist movements and so on. And people were very much afraid of, of that something similar, what was happening in Donbass would happen to their cities. So many uh, East uh, Ukrainian and South Ukrainian cities were covered enormously with uh, different uh, types of Ukrainian symbols, mostly blue and yellow color coloring uh, of national flag. And in interviews, we have two different attitudes. Some, for some people, uh, it was scary when they came and we have an excerpt from the interview that the person who came and everywhere, uh, uh, she, she was surrounded with Ukrainian symbols everywhere and they could not stay this situation and they would decide to uh, return back to occupied territories of Donbass. Or for the others, this symbolic marking of Ukrainian uh, spaces was a, a very positive thing. And for them, as soon they would, associate with them and as soon as they cross the border, they feel home. So Ukrainian symbols can be 
give feeling of home for once, but can be scary for, for some other groups of the population. Uh, when they talk about the sense of local and national, quite often they would define their home either with the particular uh, small localities like immediate space of everyday interaction, home, shop, place of work, but even more often they would describe their locality using the social groups, the people. And uh, many people uh, in the interviews would say that we lost our home or we lost our locality because now different people are living there and uh, we don't feel anymore that this is our home, uh, this is place to return to because people are different. So uh, in this sense, this uh, sense of belonging to locality might be connected to the places, but also to the social groups. Uh, quite often in their narratives, we would find that comfortable, peaceful, local space would suddenly become dangerous and a violent national, international stru struggle. And many of them would, uh, would say that this conflict is coming from above. So, uh, they, they would not associate with that conflict and they would claim quite often that uh, we were living here uh, quite peacefully and out of sudden something came from above. If we look at the major or key, the most important identities for those who come from uh, Donbass, uh, they didn't like to associate with uh, refugees groups. And we also observe very similar phenomenon those who left Ukraine right now uh, and are staying in, in different countries also outside of the Ukraine. So verbally, they quite often claim that they don't want to be labeled as refugees. And many of them also adopt the strategy similar to what Ukrainian internally displaced people were adopting that they would not register. Uh, and if they're talking about identities, they strongly stress their social, professional, and most of all, urban identities. So uh, the key differentiation is between smaller localities or professional groups and the big cities, big urban spaces. And they describe the identification with all Ukrainian urban spaces, not with Russian speaking or regional groups in, in the interviews. And uh, we have two types of uh, national identification. Some would claim that in general, national identity is not so significant, that this uh, articulated national difference uh, is articulated politically from above and is a result of manipulations and is not important for them. Others would uh, say that right now they are quite uh, actively rethinking their identity and this would often lead to a proactive position within the civil society. Uh, and in response to, to the displacement, uh, the whole Ukrainian society also uh, was active uh, in support that this map shows us that uh, people from uh, almost equally in all regions of the country were supporting IDPs. So if we look at the structure of the resettlement, we remember that the majority settled along the uh, contact lines. But if we look at the civil society support, uh, we, we observe that we do not see any regional differences. So it doesn't matter whether there, there were a lot of refugees or just a, a small number, people were actively involved in supporting uh, IDPs. If we look at the civil society engagement, we observe that one group behaved a little bit differently. These were Crimean Tatars. So as soon as they will, would move uh, uh, and settle in a, in a certain locality, they would try as soon as possible to establish national cultural uh, official or uh, first non-official organization and promote uh, Crimean Tatar culture within the uh, local uh, population and also talk about uh, Crimean Tatar history and traumatic events, for example, the deportation of Crimean Tatars. So they would uh, stress their difference, religious, 
eth ethno-cultural, historical uh, moments that are different uh, and try to educate local population about those differences. Uh, those who uh, who would who came from Donbass, they they would try to stress or use op opposite uh, uh, situations. So they would try to stress that we are the same. You cannot differentiate us from others. Uh, there were many different. Uh, uh, activities organized under, under that slogan. So look, for example, at this photo exhibition, can you pick up those who are, who are displaced from Donbass? You can't, so we are the same. So they would stress on the sameness or uh, they would also uh, build up some uh, oral history and encounters stressing their pro-Ukrainian position or, or uh, trying to combat the stereotypical approach that all people in Donbass are separatists and they wanted to, to, to cooperate with Russia and so on. Or they also were very important as people with a high level of human capital who, who spoke different languages, who, who knew how to work with international donor organizations. They were quite uh, actively involved in the uh, process which was triggered by the decommunization when uh, looking for new identities of East and South uh, Ukrainian um, cities which traditionally were labeled or seen as soviet ugly industrial uh, not interesting for tourists and uh, here we have for example uh, mariupol which was one of the well-known cases of uh, recreation or re-articulation of cities identities and opening it to, to tourist activities before uh, it was destroyed uh, during this uh, recent aggression of, of Russian Federation. So at the same time, I want to stress that uh, division between citizens, IDPs and refugees is extremely blurred because people, some of people decided not to register. So they, they cannot be spotted or uh, as, as IDPs. Or, for example, some people were at certain point IDPs, then they would try to go abroad and seek some refugee or other uh, possibilities and then come back. So we, we constantly see shifting positions in between. And uh, if we, we are talking about recent events, again, what we observe, we observe a very intensive refugee weaponization happening in January. Uh, these pictures I, I made from, from the media just before the beginning of the conflict uh, of the Russian aggression, and they needed a picture uh, again using all this rhetoric about humanitarianism of re refugees saving people sa saving brotherly nation and so on so um uh, they they were moving a certain number of ev evacuating a certain number of of people from donbass to the russian territories and we are talking about several thousand people but uh, it, which would be quite easy to accommodate within the big, big Russian cities, but they were deliberately placed, if you look at the middle of nowhere in January in mud, uh, to have a picture, an image of humanitarian catastrophe. And uh, we also observe uh, a lot of uh, attempts to build up uh, the image of migration crisis that uh, Europe will be facing because they are accepting Ukrainian refugees. So they are scaring Europe or EU with 10 million refugees, with drug distribution, uh, that people will be selling human organs, uh, with forgotten disease that Ukrainians will bring with themselves, and also that they will lead uh, because Nazi criminals will uh, escape to, to Europe and then they would lead to revival of Nazi ideas uh, in, in, in Europe. 
So uh, just to finalize, I will say a few words about the current situation. So uh, the map of the top uh, is showing the, the, the most hot spots of fights ha happening in Ukraine. The map in green shows the level of urbanization uh, in Ukraine. So we see that the fights are happening exactly in the in the regions with the highest level of urbanization, which means that this creates the biggest level of displacement because people are uh, in, in the population in those cities are very high and they are uh, displaced. So we are talking about in between 10 and 12 million affected, but this time. Uh, EU reacted differently. Ukrainians, first of all, uh, due to visa free regime and also to the decision of the EU to grant a special status to Ukrainians. So now uh, we have close to 6 million people who crossed the border and majority of, of them, those who applied were able to receive uh, asylum, temporary asylum status uh, within the EU. And uh, we are talking, about very different numbers within the Ukraine. Uh, some are talking about the official statistics is saying that we are talking about 1.5 million of IDPs. Uh, other statistics are, are saying that this is 6 million and I'll explain why. And we also are talking about close to 2 million of, of people who return. Uh, we did a pilot survey of uh, those refugees who left, online survey who left for Poland, Ireland, and Germany. And the map below uh, represents the percent of people coming from different oblasts of Ukraine, of Ukraine. And what we observe that actually those uh, oblasts uh, with the highest number of IDPs and which the uh, most active uh, military activities are sending less population partially because people are trapped there, but also partially because those who were resettled in 2014 or after the beginning of the Donbass conflict, they have very little resources. And this was one of the reasons why they didn't move further within the country. And now these people do not have resources for second or third resettlement uh, in their life. So uh, if we are talking about specific features, first of all, we have to talk about double or triple displacement, both of Ukrainian IDPs, but also international refugees, because uh, Ukraine was a host country for, for example, Russian, Belarusian, and many other refugees from the post-Soviet space. Uh, we are talking about displacement in two or three stages. Uh, changing roles. Uh, again, people, some of them are staying as internally displaced and moving abroad and returning back. Uh, mostly women with kids uh, with quite high human capital, according to our surveys, and uh, very intensively uh, involved in different types of uh, civic activism. And we also have to talk about ethnic and religious diversity. Uh, and if we look what is happening currently in media, we have debates about the unequal approach to Ukrainian refugees, both in EU and uh, as IDPs, because we have old IDPs and new IDPs and very different approach of Ukrainian states to them. And we also have a, a slightly different role of diasporas, post-Soviet and Ukrainian diaspora, uh, outside of the Ukraine, helping uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, to, to, to settle down. And here I would stop uh, my presentation and try to answer your questions. So. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thanks for this overview of your previous research and I'm also linking it to some of the dynamics we observe now. Um, yes, please start writing questions or comments in the chat. I will pick them up from there. But before we do so, I see the first ones coming in. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about um, research methodology. I mean, this is obviously a topic that's particularly difficult to research systematically. There are also huge ethical issues to address. 
Um, maybe you could, and you, you're using both quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, I know this is a huge topic and you could give entire talks on this, but maybe you could sort of sum up a few of the, um, maybe also your main, main conclusions of what can be done where the limits are of, of research on displacement. Uh, results I was prepared, uh, presenting here are mostly uh, qualitative in-depth interviews conducted uh, in many different stages in many different projects beginning from 2014 till uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, in, in this collection or archive of interviews, I have interviews with uh, displaced people those who, who were settling in different regions of Ukraine, uh, and also with people who decided to either return or stay uh, in uh, temporary occupied territories, and those who went abroad uh, to Poland, Turkey, Germany, Switzerland, and Russia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have very few interviews in Crimea because we had ethical issue and the problem was conducting field work research in Crimea. First of all, uh, at the earliest stage, one of our interviewers was caught by Russian FSB and interrogated. She, she was let, let out, but at this moment, we immediately decided to stop any any field work there because we didn't want to endanger her or our uh, in, uh, respondents. And this was in early uh, 2015. Uh, but after that in 2016, when we returned and tried to uh, interview people uh, again, in, those who returned to Crimea from uh, Ukrainian mainland, uh, we encountered the issue that uh, people were willing to talk privately, but as soon as you uh, ask to record, uh, they immediately would refuse. We tried different uh, interviewers, locals, Crimean Tatars, and also uh, people from uh, sociologists from Russia with the liberal views, but it didn't work. So people refused and again, we, we had to stop and we didn't use this opportunity. So we have really very few interviews from, from Crimea. Uh, I also use part of region, nation and beyond survey results. This maps, I, I map of civil society support uh, is was produced uh, using this, this survey. This was over 6,000 sample. Uh, in, in March uh, 2015 and then in 2017. I do not have any uh, survey data linked to occupied territories of uh, either Crimea or Donbass. Um, for, for many reasons, I think that uh, the information we can get from those uh, surveys are quite problematic if we are talking about such sensitive issues as belonging, as sense of belonging, and, and many others I, I, other I was discussing here. Uh, I also have some interviews with people from occupied territories who came to Ukrainian territories uh, at the, at, and they were interviewed in the cross, cross, close to cross uh, contact line zone. So this was another opportunity of talking to people and getting the experiences. But of course, uh, this creates a situation of research bias uh, because people are on certain, in certain contexts uh, would speak or not speak about certain, certain issues or specifically, again, if we are talking about sensitive issues with them. Thank you so much. Um, let's pick up a few points from the chat. Um, Monica goes back to the term that struck me too when you said managing otherness and says it's a very compelling formulation. It seems to be perhaps related to what um, an anthropologist at the University of North Carolina, um, Dr. Julia Morris calls uh, or, or works on as well when she um, 
uh, focuses on extractive resource extractive regimes and talks about the commodification of human mobility. So she's wondering if uh, you see, or would it be fair, she says, to think of your research results about managing otherness as a way of reaping political capital from human mobility. Is that what you had in mind? I, I borrowed that exactly this term of man managing otherness uh, from Michael's case uh, article where he de debated belonging to, to the British nation and immigration issues. And I think in this case, uh, there are a lot of debates and discussions brought by intensive uh, migrations uh, who deserve to belong and also who deserve different types of social support. Uh, and again, if we are using uh, the terminology of uh, American uh, sociologists I was presenting, she is also using this term of, of uh, who deserves to be rescued. Yeah, so quite often this political regimes so or states who would decide to accept certain groups or not to accept, they would use certain reasoning why this group should be or is accepted and or why it is not welcomed and quite often they would be talking about otherness as as an element of mm -hmm. thank you um tamara is asking whether you could comment on gender aspects of the recent um migration or displacement linked to war do you see any risks for women who are refugees in the eu Yes, of course, uh, I, I see, uh, and uh, even I do not, I, I follow um, many local Ukrainian chats, and immediately from the very first days, uh, there were a lot of warnings and posts uh, from the local activists saying that please do, especially in those cases when uh, people who are accepted have to live within the families. And if they don't know those families, uh, British scheme would be notorious for this as well, because you cannot come to Britain without having a sponsor. Um, but also in some EU countries, uh, if you don't want to live in a refugee center, then you are living within the family. And some, quite often you know someone, but if you don't know, then you risk to be trapped uh, for human trafficking or for for sex labor and so, and, and so on and but i do believe that this this topic is still an understudied thank you there's a lot of questions coming in on your on the most recent part of your research and what's happening now but we'll go back into kind of your earlier research in a moment as well well, Elena is asking whether um, you, you uh, perceive, like her, um, a split between local people and IDPs, and that that might be perhaps a more lasting new social split. And she refers to um, billboards on streets with appealing to, to male refugees as golden boys in the quotation marks who will have to go to the front line and instructions for refugees on how to behave. Um, so this um, these were given as examples so to illustrate that, that question. Is that a split that you observe as well, if that is part of your research at the moment? It wasn't, but I can comment a little bit. Uh, first of all, having an experience with uh, the first wave, first wave of displacement, there were also uh, similar cases. But in in our inter in depth interviews, we uh, constantly were asking about the experiences of the conflict or uh, conflict experiences uh, within the local communities. Uh, and quite often this would be uh, specific media cases because media also all are always uh, or social media quite often function in this way that they uh, they need some emotional takes. Uh, so they would look for exotic and specific uh, cases and then make a big deal of them. Uh, but, uh, and similarly, I saw that InfoSapiens re uh, released a new survey showing that absolute majority of Ukrainians are very supportive of displaced people. 
So uh, we have to differentiate, uh, we have to look, of course, for, for these situations, but we also have to differentiate between media discourse and the real situation and cooperation within the uh, local communities. And with this uh, comments about the men and what they should do, very similar situation was happening especially in the smaller loca localities like villages or small cities where uh, those who are displaced can be very easily sp spotted. And in our interviews, if we are talking about the conflicts, this, this would bring some conflicts uh, when, for example, someone from the village was sent to the front line and died or was fighting there. And then there would be families of displaced with, with men settling within this community. So there were several cases in the smaller localities where this discourse was present already beginning 2014. Thank you. And um, Tatiana is asking an interesting question um, to ask you whether you can say anything about the social ties and personal networks of IDPs. Um, and, and refugees, are there, I mean, are they changing kind of before and after now um, this, this full-scale war? Um, have these networks changed due to displacement and are there also links to um, Ukrainians abroad? Mm, I, I guess it's a little bit difficult to assess. Uh, we need research to, do, to be conducted, but uh, I can say just a little bit about the German situation because in this online survey, we used the question, how many people do you know in your new locality of Ukrainian origin and also locals? And uh, if we compare between Ireland, Poland and Germany, then in Germany, uh, it looks that uh, the situation is, uh, and but majority, over 50% of uh, refugees in Germany are staying, first of all, with families. So this, or friends, which means that they are using social networks for moving to Germany. But again, this could be also the, the question of numbers. If we compare, for example, Germany and Poland, because number of people who went to Poland and those who went to Germany are very different. Uh, here we could more compare between probably Ireland and, and, and Germany. And the percent of people who knew more than six people of local or many locals, and not only Ukrainians, was much higher in Germany than in Poland in, in, and in Ireland. So again, I guess that in, in certain cases, this local diasporas uh, are quite actively helping and working, and also uh, Ukrainian labor migration, with, which was happening after 2017. People, when they were allowed to, using visa-free regime to go uh, and work abroad, uh, now are quite intensively happening or stepping in and supporting. So I assume, yes, that these social networks are very important and they are working, but I guess we need more research to be conducted to, to say more about the specifics of different countries or different social groups. Thank you. And uh, Tatiana is asking uh, whether you think um, that the Ukrainian government has learned its lessons from 2014-15. Is it now better prepared for the current wave of IDPs? It's probably a quite difficult question given that it's a the dimensions of the war are different, um, so it's not a um, even probably more difficult situation now to react to it. But but nevertheless, are there is there some sort of lessons lessons learned that you see in action? It's difficult to say. Is it really lessons learned? Because if we look at the situation with IDPs before the beginning of this Russian aggression, ah. Uh, it's only in November 2021 that Ukrainian government finally adopted a program of integration. So it took almost so many years for them to think what to do with this, this group of people, which shows that they were not really prepared to thinking in terms 
uh, or learning something. And if you look at this, this program of integration is actually almost copied from the similar uh, adopted a year before in EU. So they were just co almost copy pasting it. Uh, so, so I do not, see, I haven't seen really well thought pol policies towards this place before, but now I think this was more ad hoc creation that we have millions of people on move and somehow we have to do something about that. And in this case, of course, there's rules that you can register online without all these humiliating procedures and amount of money Ukrainian government was giving was very different. But now step by step, Ukrainian government is trying to change this, those rules from very easy to, to more strict as I see. So, the big question would be what will be happening in, in a few months. And also, uh, it's very important to, to see that those who registered, uh, according to Ukrainian statistics, there's only 1.2 or 1.5 million. But in reality, number is at least two, three, or some, some people, some demographers say four times higher, which means that quite often people were using informal networks. For example, flats, uh, flat of their friends, or uh, this could be uh, several step displays so that people from, I don't know, uh, Mariupol would move somewhere to Zaporizhia and those from Zaporizhia would move to someone's flat somewhere in the central Ukraine and those would move somewhere, somewhere abroad. So uh, people were sharing their own resources quite intensively without involving state support in this case. Thank you. And Lindsay had asked whether you could put the last slide up again on skills and needs. And I was also um, going to ask you about that again. You went through that quite quickly, but if you could mm -hmm. maybe um, maybe you want to add a, a couple of three sentences to you, also your conclusions, what you draw from that. But there was quite a lot of information on that that slide. Maybe you could mm -hmm. um, un unpack that in another minute or two. So within this pi pilot pilot survey, uh, I tried to we asked questions about the needs and also uh, tried to look at the skills. So we asked. Uh, Rep, uh, people who resettled in Poland or in Germany or in, in Ireland ab about their skills. And here I'm commenting only about Germany because the, the main focus of, of my research was in Germany. So uh, in Germany, in opposite to what Russian propaganda was saying about the, the what will happen with Ukrainian refugees, first of all, the top need because there was a long list of different types of needs that people could choose five, the most pressing and measure, there was a five scale measurement for that. So uh, the top priority was to find a job. And then German uh, language, and we also asked about the language proficiently, see. So unfortunately about those who, who are staying currently in Germany, only 6% of adults and 3% of kids uh, are proficient in, in German. And also 70% of those who, who are surveyed in, in Germany said that schools or kindergartens is uh, another top priority. And I think this is due to the gender dimension because absolute majority uh, of those who, who left Ukraine are young women with kids. And to be able to uh, go to the job market, first, uh, they need kids to, to be uh, located either to have placements, either in kinder kindergartens or schools, because if kids are not there, then they cannot uh, go and seek uh, the job placement. And uh, as I said, over 51% uh, claim that uh, they have housing with volunteers, friends, or relatives, which is different in Poland and in Ireland. Those, uh, their bigger proportion of people uh, said that they also uh, placed in refugee centers. 
Uh, and we also asked, uh, I uh, commented about the social network, uh, and we also asked question whether they intend to stay uh, or leave. And we have approximately almost even numbers of people saying that they don't know or will leave, or the, and those who stay that they are planning to stay over a year or year in, in Germany. But this uh, these numbers are lower in Poland if we compare Poland and Germany. And uh, we also asked, are you planning to look for jobs? Because again, in this Russian propaganda piece I was, I was quoting, they say they scare Europe that Ukrainian refugees would come and, and live on, on so, so social support and they won't work and only claim things or money. So we see that immediate only 20% said that they they know they don't want to seek for jobs. And quite often this is this group which which intends to leave soon. And uh, 41 already within one month of stay are planning to, to look for, for some kind of job. And we, feel, uh, we also asked about skills they have, they possess. Uh, we see that in Germany, we have uh, people, the, the, the most often named skills were science, education, business, and childcare. So again, we, we are talking about a group with quite high uh, human resource abilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for going going through that. I think that deserved does it deserved more attention attention than you than you could give it initially. Um, I wanted to ask you about a kind of the identity questions you talked about with regard to the research between 2014 and 16. Um, you said I found it striking, and it's it's very intuitively it makes makes sense and. Um, I think in the work I did on displays, something similar came up that people identify very strongly with a professional identity and with an urban identity if if they came from urban locations. Um, were you able to trace what, what happens with that if that changes over time? I mean, I, I also find it really compelling that ethno-linguistic um, identities as so often um, don't matter or matter a lot less. Um, what happens to regional or local um, identities in terms of where you came from? No, is that separate from the urban, or does it become maybe important, more important over time? Is there some movement? So, what what happens with the local or regional identity, and and are there other changes in terms of what happens? And probably it was also linked to what you said about national identity that that's not important. That made me wonder. I mean, of course, you can define national identity very differently. You know, and if it's a more kind of exclusive or inclusive notion of national identity, I mean, should this not be maybe um, uh, kind of people who who will at least over time um, uh, put forward a more inclusive or the wish for an inclusive identity that as they are having to place themselves in different contexts. No? So um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about these different identity dimensions. I think that with regional identity, it's uh, it's very difficult to say, is, is it, isn't it, whether it's not important or people don't want to use this identity because especially if you come, you're coming from Donbass, this identity might bring some othering or I don't know stereotypes that people who come from Donbass they are separatists and, and all the stereotypes. So maybe because in our interviews uh, it, I haven't seen a strong signs of uh, regional identity present, but again this might be just contextual reaction. Um, about local identity, as I said, we we. With Crimean Tatars, it's very different. For Crimean Tatars, this local identity is number one, a top identity. So when they talk about, uh, and I think this this is because they were displaced during the, the Soviet Union, and for them to preserve their, their identity as a group uh, that was uh, de deported, they needed to preserve memory about where they came from and their history. So they, they learned uh, to preserve this identity within the family stories. 
And here, because this is a, a new, uh, for some, some of them, second displacement, they are using the same strategy. So uh, immediately, if you ask, they, they will center their narrative around the uh, localities in Crimea uh, with specific, uh, specifically important either for them or for their group as a Crimean Tatars. And they will also include a lot of historical narr narratives or historical memory, not only about the Stalinist deportation, but also about uh, history of Crimea in general, beginning from, from uh, the Catherine the Great and all, all those issues. So in this sense, for them, locality and local identity is a key identity which is articulated. For people from coming from Donbass, uh, it's less important, this urban identity. And I think this is also par uh, partially this post-Soviet uh, proudness of uh, belonging to well-modernized, developed urban spaces that, that they could share with uh, within any, any big city and any locality. And, and professional identities would be also come or play along with, with these narratives. And uh, another issue would be that, as I said, quite often they would talk about the split within their communities back home or families, and this would endanger the whole story or narration about the locality because then they, would say that certain people with whom they are do not communicating any longer or now they are living absolutely new groups of people with or those people who have a new set of mind they don't share and for this reason this local identity original identity is no longer important for them but in interviews with those who stayed uh, on occupied territories we, I see a lot of articulation exactly of local or uh, regional Donbass identity. So I, I'm, I was born here, Donbass is extremely important for me and I want to die here. This is my place, my region, so I don't want to leave this. And if they would talk about national identity, they would use this Soviet formula of nationalist that uh, they would talk about the, first of all, that we all lived here uh, without any conflict. There were so many different groups, but we, are, we were quite international and national identity was not important for us. And another uh, formula they would be use, uh, using uh, this ascribed nationality. So my parents or my mom is so-and-so, that's why I'm so-and-so. And uh, this element of political self-identification would be less important than for those who left, for example, and would come to Ukrainian territories. That quite often, for, in these cases, they would also sometimes use, especially elderly people, first the Soviet formula that I was born or in my passport time, and Russian, Ukrainian, whatever, but I feel and because of the displacement now so and so. Thank you. Um, Lindsay is asking um, if you could expand a bit on the manner in which places of memory contribute to a, in quotation marks a sense of being lost for an IDP from Donetsk or Luhansk. Um, I think that there is a very good article published in nationality papers. Uh, Victoria Lazarenko, if I'm not mis mistaking the name, uh, she described the whole phenomenon much better. Uh, but I, I also came across this in, in interviews with uh, people resettled from, from Donbass. So for them, from, for some of them, because those cities were where they came from, even from occupied territories, were officially re renamed and new names were, were used in Ukrainian, for example, media for, for those places. Uh, it gave additional feeling that 
place or street I'm coming from is not existing any longer. So, and added to the feeling of being, being lost. But at the same time, uh, what we also observed in, in those interviews, that uh, pe when people were resettling to, to another cities or in other regions of the, of the country, they would explore a lot of uh, local spaces and come across new, I don't know, monuments or, um, or quite often they would attend certain uh, excursions and will learn about new names of streets and so on. And this would trigger re-articulation of historical narratives of historical memory uh, within this group as well. Thank you. Um, I don't see many any more questions or comments in the chat, but if I may, I'd like to ask you two more questions and I asked them sort of all at once. Um, you started at the beginning with giving us the different kind of official legal statuses and, and, and also the numbers, often very low numbers of um, who got what status where. Um, but I was wondering sort of where you're making the link from sort of who who does or doesn't get the status, how that affects um, the belonging or the identities. Um, and, and if so, I mean, does it does it even matter to, I mean, put it in a simplified way, sort of what status is given to some of the um, aspects of belonging that you are you are discussing, and also in particular the different nuances between um, different legal statuses. No, sort of maybe it's different if you don't get any of them, or you maybe don't want, or you can't get any of them. Um, and the second question is really different, um, which I found very interesting. Different um, issue area that you said um, many IDPs start engaging in um, helping other IDPs and become sort of um, civically engaged. And I was wondering if there is, if this again is something that you traced over time. I mean, is this very issue specific, or does it then also um, kind of spill over, if that's the right word, into into other engagement? Is this um, kind of a broader trend? I'm partly asking this because interesting new um, sort of survey data already showed also before the war sort of a massive increase again in both civic engagement and and also uh, views on under what circumstances you need to engage and that jump is actually I find hard to explain and as you were talking I thought is this maybe one element of explaining this um, or does it remain quite issue issue specific? Mm, I think that first of all we have to talk about different types of enga engagement, both from the side of receiving communities and ID displaced people. Uh, there was a first immediate reaction to the humanitarian catastrophe happening in Ukraine because Ukrainian state for a quite a long time uh, was really not supporting or giving any support for a few months. And then those this support Ukrainian state was giving was so small that you cannot survive with it. So uh, it was very important uh, that those people with no resources who were resettling that both local society, and, and this is very similar to what is happening right now in, I know, in Poland, in Germany, in many other countries, that first the civil society steps in and supports, and then gradually state or local uh, administration realizes, aha, we have a big problem, a big issues, and we, we need money and we need resources and so on. So, but of course, this, this activism uh, can go on for some time, but because people cannot leave their businesses or live their lives only as volunteers or give their flats for forever and, and so on. So after initial stage, of course, the, the initial split, uh, there the would be a wave going down. And this is exactly moment where the state should step in, both in, Ukraine, in the case of Ukraine. But at the same time, we could also say that some initial needs were also uh, resolved. Yes, if people needed some really basic things, uh, they got them at, during this initial moment. And then we see that actually a little bit kind of fatigue with helping IDPs in Ukraine. If you look at some surveys, 
then by uh, and I also think that this is linked to the um, change, discursive changes within the political elites. If uh, Poroshenko was constantly stressing that we have a war with Russia and this alerted situation would also alert uh, people, common citizens, that if we have a war, if there is a war, we need to, to help and we need to be active in, in helping. But then uh, with Zelensky coming with a so slogan of peacekeeping or peace, peacemaking, yes? And uh, the, the whole discourse within the society by 2018 is media that we, we, we make as much as possible, we make, we make peace, we, we live in peace. And then at this moment, we see the fatigue that people saying, aha, if we don't have any longer some acute conflict or acute needs. And, but then with the COVID, it returns back, but because many people see that again, state, state is not always supportive and or unable to support or doesn't have enough resources. And then the civil activism is going up. At least this is what I see from, from some data. And the other question about was about the legal status, if that um, translates into um, something sort of systematic in terms of the, the belonging. So, yes, yes. So people uh, talk a lot, uh, a lot about uh, being rejected or being not uh, that they that they cannot apply for this statuses and why these groups can apply and we cannot. Uh, we are second rate and this one, that's why we are pushed to certain niches. Uh, so this would translate to the sense of belonging to the communities. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. I don't see any more questions at this point, but I think we've, we've asked quite a lot already. So thank you so much again for your uh, presentation, for all the important research you're doing and are carrying on at the moment. Um, so. Um, it's the wrong word to say we look forward to to more of your findings, but we need them. Let's put it let's put it that way. Um, as always, we'll put the recording of your talk and the discussion up on the Zoe's website in the coming days. Um, and I would also like to already invite you for next week's lecture, which will be given by Tamara Matinyuk uh, from Kiev Mohila Academy. It will be on women's participation in the Euromaidan protests and the war in Ukraine. And there's a small change. We'll start half an hour later, just that one time. So we'll start at 6 p.m. next Thursday. So I hope to see many of you again, spread the word. This is really open to anyone. And uh, Victoria, thank you again. That was, that was great. Thank you.